don't be afraid to do it your way, I think would be the sage piece of advice because you are going to appeal to the person who's looking for that different thing, who's looking for mm -hmm. your approach or your aesthetic or your, uh, you know, the feeling they get when they come into your space. So there's just so much room for creativity in what we do, even anchoring to sound scientific principles. And I think mm -hmm. that's the magic is, can you get the science and the art to meld together? Your kids are soft. You lack discipline. We landed on the moon! You didn't earn the knowledge for yourselves, so you don't take any responsibility. I thought we forgotten who we are. Explorers, pioneers. How many, three weeks, four weeks in the making with just initial <laughs> scheduling and then we had a little schedule mishap, but uh, Capo, Steve Capo Bianco kind of put us in contact, which I was looking, when did you come to the farm to teach a class? Uh, that had to have been, I think it was in either 2018 or 2019. I don't really, I don't even remember. It was a while. Like, it was pre-COVID for sure. That's what I was Definitely. just going to say. Totally different era pre-COVID. I um, know. Yeah. So I, we've never met in person, even though Mike's been in my clinic, I was out of town for something. I don't know. Um, I think you were racing. I think you had a race Probably or race or I, think <laughs> I, might been, I might've been with a tennis athlete or something, but so we've never met in person this first time meeting you digitally, which is awkward to say, but that's the truth. Yep. Uh, so I just wanted to get the rundown on kind of, obviously I've seen you on social media. I know what you do, but I don't really know who you are. So I wanted to kind of hear the origin story of like, how'd you get into this profession and then kind of, you know, how you got into it, but like where you're at today, like what's your practice look like now? Why'd you get into, you know, practice on your own and kind of give me that rundown. So, yeah, I mean, um, so I'm a certified athletic trainer by trade in ATC. So, you know, I, I did my undergraduate work at Marist college in athletic training and sports medicine. And that really started for me because I, like most athletic trainers, I was an injured athlete, you know, I was all American mm -hmm. high, uh, lacrosse player in high school. And I kind of was in that. And again, this was back in the early 2000s. So it's a little different, the recruiting process then than it is now. So I, I hadn't really made a decision yet on where I wanted to go to school. So I was like, I'm going to play my senior year and I'm going to figure it out after the season's over. I ended up tearing my ACL, PCL, MCL meniscus, tibial plateau fracture, like the whole shebang. So good one. Yeah. Yeah. It was a, you know, collision injury, basically a, a knee dislocation, essentially. Yeah. Where like the, like I basically blew out the, the MCL and the ACL and the PCL and just had a compression fracture on mm -hmm. the, on the tibia. So, um, I had a micro fracture procedure. I was, I was one of the first double bundle ACLs ever done or was, at least was part of like, yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a clinical trial that I was in. I ended up in and, um, so I had the knee reconstructed and Marist college was the last division one lacrosse program to offer me any money. And they happen to have an athletic training program. So that's how it worked out hey. for me. And, that's yeah. So I did my four years. I, I got certified as an athletic trainer. Uh, I went on, I worked at the university of Florida for a couple of years and I worked with their sports medicine staff. Um, then I went to graduate school at George Washington university. So got my master's in business administration while I was a grad assistant. I worked with baseball and men's soccer were like my two sport assignments, but you know, the kind of the long story short was, you know, my journey as a clinician was really mostly inspired by my, uh, my inability to return to my prior level of performance. You know, I was a guy in high school that ran a sub four six forty, And uh, that was a lot of what my game was, was just the ability to make space with my legs and make stuff happen on the field. Just being a good athlete. I wasn't a very good look. I wasn't the best lacrosse player by like a skills mm -hmm. perspective, but I was just a really, really good athlete. Um, and so that just kind of became an obsession. Honestly, I was so depressed and, um, you know, I really suffered a lot of like identity crisis in my college years, just not being able to stay healthy, not being able to contribute to my team in a meaningful way, feeling like I didn't belong there because I just wasn't the same guy. So I kind of went on a mission to, to figure these things out for myself. And that's kind of where my continuing education journey started. And then really diving into the strength and conditioning stuff became like a big piece of it, like not really being fulfilled with what the rehab process was. And, and kind of as an athlete, again, as 18 years old, I'm doing this rehab doing everything everybody's telling me to do. I'm just like, how is this getting ready? How are these straight leg raises with a cuff weight getting me ready to play division one lacrosse? Like how is a basic leg press or, you know what I mean? It was just so mm -hmm. basic and rudimentary. I was like, there's gotta be a better way. This just doesn't make any sense to me. Um, and so, you know, again, it was just more of a discovery process of figuring out what worked for me. And then in doing so, 
what I think is maybe a little bit more of like the secret sauce to help other people, you know, mm -hmm. overcome chronic pain, mobility limitations, uh, and then get and create sustainable plans for people to get back. So my business, the movement underground is, you know, we call it all inclusive. It's very similar to, to your facility. Mm -hmm. And in the sense that we have like physical therapy and sports medicine, strength and conditioning, and then what we call a recovery lab, which is, you know, the recovery modalities that are everybody's talking mm -hmm. about, cold plunge, infrared sauna, red light therapy, intermittent compression. So we kind of wanted to build like a one-stop shop for anybody who's on the spectrum of either injury, pain, or maybe just wants to take maybe a little bit more of an educated approach to their training. Yeah. Well, you said uh, the secret sauce. What's the secret sauce, man? You can't, you can't mention that. And oh. just know what help for us. So... So the secret sauce for me was really where I started getting into manual therapy. Um, and again, yeah. I'm not saying manual therapy is like magical in any way, but that was the piece that really helped me take the next steps in my recovery. So like when I got to Florida, I only played two years of college across. I had massive knee contracture. I think my best, I, I was, I was miss, I was maybe like 10 degrees of extension loss. So like I never got my full extension back. Never got my full flexion back. I was just hobbled, man. You know, I ended mm -hmm. up tearing my labrum and my hip, blowing out my ankles, herniated discs in my back. Just like everything I tried to do just ended up in either a new injury. And when I got to Florida, I was, just, I was working with the track and field program. And my supervisor was an athletic trainer, massage therapist. And he, I also had a nerve entrapment. So mm -hmm. in my patella tendon, uh, I had a patella tendon graft. So in that scar, I ended up getting a saphenous nerve entrapment. Mm -hmm. So even when I went to run or cut, I would get like a lightning bolt straight down my shin into my foot. And no matter who I saw, nobody ever could give me an answer as to why that happened. I was like, my doctor, oh, it's tendonitis. You got to rest it. You know, I did every, I went to every other practitioner I could find. You know, I went to a chiropractor. He was like, oh, your, your back is out of alignment. We got to realign your back. That didn't really help me out. You know, I did everything. And my, and my boss, Andy, Andy clock at UF, he was like, dude, your, your scar is like welded to your knee. Like nobody ever worked on this scar for you. I'm like, what are you talking about? And this is now as a certified athletic trainer, four years into sports medicine. Like I didn't even know at that point yeah. that maybe like my knee, scar was an issue. Eyes open. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm just like my knee, <clears throat> so my knee's weak. I'm in pain. Like I can't straighten it. That's my problem. So he started really doing a lot of manual therapy with me, like traditional myofascial release. Like I remember that first day, Bo, I was on the table and he starts he started just shearing my skin like superiorly on my knee and I started just dumping sweat like the <laughs> table, like it was dripping sweat off the side of the table. And I started feeling that same, that same referral pain down my foot. And I'm like, Andy, I'm like, you, whatever you're doing, man, you're on it. And mm -hmm. he, in one month, that man did more for me than in the previous four years. And I was like, Whoa, man, like, and at that point too, like even like my program for sports medicine, it was like, oh, we're not massage therapists, we're not doling out massages yeah. in the athletic training room. You know, we're doing like STEM and ultrasound, like cool science stuff. And it was like, you know, laugh because now <laughs> it's like, I don't do any of that shit. Yeah. But yeah. um, sorry, I didn't mean to curse. I'm, oh, you're it's kind of, oh, all right. open, for, open forum. I'm from New York, man. It's like, it's, uh, hey, it's my thing. You know, it, just, it comes out. So, <clears throat> so yeah. And then I'm watching Andy work with these, you know, like we're working with, Olympic level athletes and, and watching what he could do to change their pain, improve their range of motion instantly on the table. I'm like, man, that's it. That's what I want to learn. I want to learn how to really help people cross the bridge over and be able to create opportunities. And again, at that time, this is like the early to mid two thousands, still very mechanical mindset behind a lot of what we were doing, but it worked and our athletes were performing at a high level. They were healthy. They were very rarely hurt and we were getting just tremendous results. And um, so I just kind of took that mindset and applied it to everybody, which is, you know, stripping down all of maybe some of the extras that you don't necessarily need to get better. Hands-on work, one-on-one -on -one coaching, really trying to dig deep with people and figure out what their linchpins are, mm -hmm. um, whether that's lifestyle stuff, whether that's movement stuff, whether that's just not having a good direction and being able to prioritize the things that maybe move the needle for them the most. Um, and, th and that's kind of what we've pared it down to. So it's manual therapy, movement, combining those two things, understanding that we're not fixing people necessarily on the table, but if we can create an opportunity for them, maybe get them a win in that process, switch their mindset around what their condition is uh, and use that as a vehicle to create some autonomy and some sustainability for them. 
Well, there's two things there that I want to dive into. One is <clears throat> I love that you're the secret sauce is manual therapy, but then you're like, you still have to find out what the biggest linchpin is for somebody. It's not just sure. like, well, that's what we do because that's our thing, which I love. Second, what I'm curious. So early two thousands, obviously that's like the heyday of ART. Yep. What, uh, what did you dive into when you're like, Oh my God, my eyes are open. This is important then. And then what do you, have you kind of come up with your own, you know, versions of things or like, what do you lean on now in terms of like, what do you want to call it? Methodologies, techniques in the manual therapy realm. Is there anything you're right. like, man, that's amazing now versus what I was doing back then. Yeah. Like I said, I think back then it was such a heavy mechanical base. You know, I had done all three ART classes while I was at Flor courses at Florida, Graston, like all the big ones that were like really popular at that time. But all of them taught a very mechanical approach, right? So even ART I, at the time was a lot of like, it's almost like a palpation course, like mm -hmm. identifying individual muscles, you know, <clears throat> pin and stretch, all the, the cool techniques. So very, very technical and I think what I've done over the years is as I've learned more about like more the neurophysiological side and how maybe this affects maybe the affect that we're getting from or the effect that we're getting from treatment is more of a neurological mm -hmm. phenomenon than a physical one. I've just simplified it, you know, understanding shearing across layers of tissue. I know Capo speaks a lot about that. And a lot of that I've kind of learned and pulled from him and he's pointed me in a lot of those cool rabbit holes to kind of learn more about, you know, um, you know, just how mechanoreceptors are integrated to the central nervous system, how we can maybe change the opinion of the brain. And just, I, so I take much more of like a neurological approach now and I just simplified it. I'm not like agonizing over, am I on the right structure? You know, and I think, I think where manual therapy kind of gets a bad rap and I feel like the pendulum's swinging back now a little bit. You got like the evidence-based bros who are just manual therapy sucks and it's pointless and it doesn't actually do anything. It's like, whoa, 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 time out. Just because the narratives are maybe a little outdated or maybe some of the models were wrong or, or we, we got those wrong 25 years ago, doesn't invalidate the entire practice. It just means we've learned more. And now the way we look at these things is just shifting. It doesn't mean it's not valuable for somebody. Um, the other part of manual therapy that I, that I kind of lean on more now is, um, I think it represents the exchange, right? So, th and what I mean by the exchange is, you know, people come to us with a problem, mostly, you know, generally a pain problem, right? You know, why do they come to see you, right? They, they're coming because mm -hmm. they have an issue that they need help with. And my big gripe for the evidence-based bros that are just like, you just got to load it and lift through it and modify, which is fine. And that's definitely part of what we're doing. But it's like, if you hired a plumber, to fix the plumbing in your house. And they came over and they assessed it and they said, okay, here's the step-by-step -step instruction on how to do it yourself. That'd be $500, please. You'd be pissed. Mm -hmm. Like nobody would feel like, oh, like that was worth it. So the way that I have reframed manual therapy in my practice, again, years ago, the narrative and the mindset was we're fixing these athletes. We're tuning them up like a race car, right? Now mm -hmm. the mindset is I'm just using manual therapy to meet that client's expectation of something being done and use that time to educate them, to empower them, to kind of problem solve while we're doing the exchange of the, the physical touch aspect or the treatment aspect, and then take that and, and parlay it into movement. And I think that's the key is like, I under, you know, listen, I don't think any of us can argue in 2024 that exercise is important. And mm -hmm. I think where this whole argument of like manual therapy versus exercise, I think it's a stupid and pointless argument to begin with because they're, it's apples and oranges. You're, they're just not the same thing, you know, and it doesn't, one being effective doesn't negate the other, right? Mm -hmm. right? So I've always believed that both are, they're better together anyway. And again, I come from a strength and conditioning background too. So I've always understood that exercise ultimately is what we have to get to, but some people need help. Some mm -hmm. people need help getting there. And they need to get over some of the mental hurdles of being ready for that. And I think treatment fills in that gap on some level. Well, this, I mean, I one of my first questions was, why do you think manual therapy is under attack? Which you kind of mentioned there. The way I always kind of, I don't know, postulated nowadays is when I was in high school, like the 90s and, you know, before that, like rehab was literally like uh, Cybex, like strength and conditioning. Like you got on an Nautilus machine and you did quad sets and, and it was like very like 
four sets of 10 for, like you said, like, you know, TKE straight leg raises. And then it's like the functional movement came around everybody's like, Oh, that stuff's crap. It's like, well, not right. if it's post-operative, you still have to get range of motion and strength back before you can do the fancy functional stuff. Well, then the functional stuff went so far and we're like, Whoa, let's be hands off because you know, then pain neuroscience came about and everybody's like, I think we may be damaging the relationship between the, the therapist and the, the patient just by, you know, creating some dependency Right. And to be honest with you, I think COVID was the nail in the coffin of hands off. Like we saw virtual consultations go through the roof. People are like, dude, I can have the same effect without ever even being in the same country as somebody. And I think it just like anything, it gets polarized on social media too. And we see the ends of it instead of mm -hmm. actually what most people that are good are doing. And also the research, if we want to be an evidence-based bro would say, no, <laughs> manual therapy plus exercise, spinal manipulation plus exercise is always better. Is now performed. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Like always. Right. So here's my thing. You've become, my question was, you know, why isn't it attacked? We talked about it. You've kind of become on social media, like an advocate for it. You know, you said the secret sauce of manual therapy, but I think it's actually, like you said, that exchange, the opportunity, right. which I think some people would push back on, like, well, aren't you just capitalizing on the expectation to get more visits or play into it? And I think you're just like, no, I'm, the expectation is being met and then it it's buy-in. I get the opportunity. And I think some people just think that like, Oh, this is how it should be done. Right. right? Like, Oh, you're no, no, no. We don't need that. Do you think it's going to turn around on its own? Do you think like you're part of the educational opportunity that's going to spin it around? Or do you think the public will push back and be like, dude, I don't want completely hands-off care. This isn't as effective um, like, what do you think needs to happen? Is it the therapists need to be educated better and like write the ship? Or do you think the, the, um, the consumer will make the turn for us? I, I think the consumers already are, you know what I yeah. mean? It's funny. Cause I had this conversation with somebody on Instagram, maybe like a week ago, which was, you know, like this was a clinician, a physical therapist who kind of like during COVID bought into the whole like Jim bro hardo mindset, which is mm -hmm. like you know, manual therapy sucks. You don't need to do it. I'm going to move my business online. I'm going to just teach exercise and exercise <laughs> modification. And she messaged me saying like, my problem is that I I want to, I want to be evidence-based and I want, and I believe that exercise is the important thing, but these clients are just going to somebody else that'll give them what they want. It's the same thing as doctor shopping. It's always been a thing. So you go to a physician and they don't give you, they don't tell you what you want to hear. So you go to another physician to find out and yeah. eventually you'll find somebody who gives you what you want. And so again, I think, I think the market will decide ultimately what's valuable and what's not. And, and again, if we look at the history of hands-on therapies, they've been around for 5,000 years. This isn't like a mm -hmm. new human phenomenon. You know what I mean? I, I love like Diane Jacobs and her stuff. And just yeah. like the idea that like humans are wired for touch. And I think, in the new age, in the digital age that we're almost deprived of that in, in many ways. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and, it, and it's, and it's more powerful than manipulating tissue. It's it, you know, like, if we're really talking about creating a therapeutic alliance and, and having somebody believe that we're on their side, we're in their corner and we're trying to help them get better. Then to me, I think that's to build that relationship on some level that that's where the exchange needs to happen. Now, mm -hmm. the way that I think the right way to go about this is, is just being honest. Like I, before even any patient or client of mine swipes the card, I tell them straight up, you do not need this to get better. It's a turbo button. It's a, it's, we're going to dump some gas on the fire. It's going to help you. Uh, uh, we're going to help address this pain problem. It's not going to fix the problem, but it's going to help. And it's going to open up some short-term range of motion. We're going to take it. We're going to take advantage of that opportunity by loading these things in a meaningful way immediately mm -hmm. after, and then give you a scalable progression from there. And I, in in my program, intentionally build like this weaning off period where they don't really need the one-on-one. -on -one. But I think if we're just transparent about it, I think we can eliminate that whole like, oh, you're creating dependency and you're doing it mm -hmm. for you know profitability reasons only. It's like, well, no. And, I, and again, for me, I didn't turn the corner personally until somebody put hands on. And that mm -hmm. helped me take that next step in my recovery. So, you know, I think, I think the transparency and the being honest about what it does and what the utility of manual therapy is, I think on the clinician side is what needs to happen, right? Yeah. But again, I've never had somebody say, you know what, Mike, since you said that I don't need it, I don't want it. I've never had that happen once in five yeah. years. 
So which I was going to ask if you ever literally put that at the forefront, which I mean, that's what you just said. I, You're, I literally lead the, the sale scene. with that. Yeah, yeah. I literally yeah. lead the sale with that. I said the, the the real important part is getting you to move better than you currently do and mm -hmm. see how that correlates to your symptoms. But let's modify some of these symptoms so that you're not having such a hard time, yeah. right? Can we Which make I love this- your, I love your posts on, uh, I don't know exactly what case, but you were talking about somebody that came in with medial tibial stress syndrome or medial shin splints, and the idea that you can kind of just load through pain, but the very first thing we know about pain is that it changes motor output, it changes movement. Right. And you're just talking about pain modulation. So. If we took the route of, you know, well, let's just go through load management progressions from day one, hands off. I I get the long-term play may be pain modulation, but we, I mean, I to me, I'm just like, how can you break this logic that if we know the number one predictor of future injuries, prior injury, and not at the same site, we pain or load manage through pain. How do you not expect the outcome to just be like you? You're like, I tore my labor in my hip. I you know, I had low back right. stuff because like your knee was driving the ship of like, you know, a motor control disaster. I was finding ways to move around it yeah. and I was, and Which I was over leveraging other tissues in order to do that. So that's where, when we say this, the evidence base, it's just kind of, I don't think it's evidence based. It's just cherry picking and bias, which we all, we know. And I say, we know, then we sound biased because it's like we're on some team. It's not a team. It's you're trying to be aware of all of the information at hand as best you can. That's evidence, what works in your own practice, what patients want, actually running a business that's sustainable at, you know, at the hand of all the information and not throwing anything out. Right. And I think in social media land, being polarizing is what wins. 100%. And that's, <laughs> no, I think you hit the nail on the you head. Get, it's like, you've got a great job of not you know, you're polarizing in the fact that you're like, well, I'm standing up for this thing, but you're not just standing for that thing. You're being totally open-minded and in my opinion, non-biased, which is actually harder to make a, a platform for. So I like applaud you for that. A hundred percent. But I think you, you hit the nail on the head. It's like, we're, it's almost like most providers are acknowledging the fact that may, the, the role of manual therapy has maybe shifted, maybe shifted over the years. And we're all in the middle, like looking at these arguments back and forth going, what the hell? Like, why, why can't we just do both? Why can't we commingle these things? And, and honestly, one of the things I'm most proud of of the movement underground is the fact that we have a clinical model that matches the business model, you know, that, that, yeah. that we can feel good about selling the service that we do because it is in line with the current body of evidence. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing too. It's like, oh, you know, manual therapy is not evidence-based. It's like, then you're not reading research. Anybody who says that, does not look at, they're only looking at research that confirms yeah. what their, what their opinion is, which is called confirmation bias. And if you've ever taken a graduate level research methods course, that's bullshit. That's like the number one, no, no, that you're not supposed to do is only is form your opinion and then find evidence that backs your opinion. Which was well, the social media. I mean, that's a hundred percent, a hundred percent. And and again, and I, like, I'm guilty of it sometimes too. I mean, I'll, I'll do a talk and I'm going and looking for the thing to substantiate, but what I've had sure. to call my own BS on is, which is great using like AI, like consensus, right? You type in, what's it going to do? It's going to literally show you how many articles refute it, how many stand for it. And then what the overarching consensus is. Hence I the love name that of the website. And you're like, oh, okay. Well, let's go look at both sides. Don't just go look at the 45% that substantiate, look at the other. So let's dive into this part because we could beat this dead horse. You and I have the same stance. It's just fun to elucidate it and, you know, highlight some nuances, which I love your point about, you know, the, the exchange. But something that you also mentioned in that uh, medial tibial stress syndrome post was anybody who's worth their salt that works with an elite athlete, the whole non-pain modulation thing is a complete farce because, and this is my question, you know, elite athletes, they either break the mold that we can use for the general public or they create it. Right. And I think you can lean on one side or the other. Like, what's your kind of stance on that? Because a lot of times we'll say, oh, we look at the, the precipice or the pinnacle and then we say, that's the ideal. Or we say, dude, they're a freak. Like, that's not the goal is to get to this like movement ideal or whatever it is. Like, how do you conceptualize the elite athlete and then how do you use that for the general public? That's such a great question. And I, it's funny because uh, I, I talked about this with a, a coaching client, like who's another coach. And we, we talked about this idea that 
listen, if, if we're looking at the one percenters in athletics, those are all statistical outliers for the most part. Mm -hmm. You know, that's not just a regular guy who trained his way into elite performance. <laughs> that's a, that is somebody that had, had something special in them and either harnessed it through training or again, I, I, the people who don't understand this are the people who really haven't worked with elite athletes. Because mm -hmm. like when I was on the football field at the University of Florida and you see an 18-year-old show up to, to camp and they can run a 4-3-40 as an 18-year-old, you're telling me they had elite strength and conditioning in high school and their elite <laughs> athletic development? No, that is yeah. – I'm sorry well, whether you believe in God or – that is God-given talent. That is something hey, – It's so usually – it's usually in the face of not good training, depending on where they're coming from. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. Like yeah. some of these kids that we had on that football team came from nothing. Yeah. Squalor. You know what I mean? Like the worst kind of living situation you could come from where sports was the only way out. And these kids were just special, special. Mm -hmm. And it's like, how do you reverse engineer that? To, and apply that to everybody. Now, I think there's some through lines that we can yeah. extrapolate from there and, and like broader brush strokes that we can look for. But the point that I made to this, it was another track coach. <clears throat> I was like, if you have 10 sub 100 meter, 10 sub 10 second 100 meter sprinters, you might have 10 different movement strategies that get into that sub 10 meter, Right. So it, how do we say that one way is optimal at that point? There might be, again, there might be through lines and things that they do similarly, but there might be as, as many things that they do differently. So it's tough, right? It's really, mm -hmm. really tough. Yeah, it's um, not cookie cutter. It's not easy. Yeah. Right. And again, it's like, and then you could even say, it's like, well, you know, does movement dysfunction correlate to pain or injury directly? And those are hard bridges Ooh. to cross. Those are hard I'm, bridges to cross, right? I'm I'm definitely putting that out on the Instagram post so people can just rip you apart and just oh, say, "Oh, for sure." Yep. <laughs> well, I mean, think so to to the point, right? And this is this is a conversation I had with Eric Cressy years ago that blew my mind, and it completely changed the way I looked at this from like a problem solving perspective. But mm -hmm. it's like if we if we can agree that good function is a range of possibilities, then what's dysfunction? the range outside of that range, yeah. but how do we define where the line is? Like, that's mm -hmm. the hard part. You know what I mean? Cause one's one man's dysfunction could be the, the special secret that he, that person has to, to that could be the, the, the double edged sword, right? It's almost yeah. like the, the compensatory patterns that we call compensations or dysfunctions m might very well be the adaptations that make that athlete special. Mm -hmm. Who are we to say? Now, and that's not to say that that doesn't maybe cause problems down the line, but at True. what point do you cross that line, right? Just in the presence of pain. So then how do you define an injury? Is it structural damage or is it only in the presence of pain that it's an injury, right? Mm -hmm. So these things aren't that clear and it's more complex than that. So when I take a, when I'm doing a movement screen, I'm just looking for the opportunities to change something in somebody's equation. I'm looking mm -hmm. for where's the biggest deficit for this person or rather where does this person stand to make the most improvement in one attribute of their movement, right? Where can I get them the most ROI on their time right now? Can I get them these wins early in the process? And then we can see how that correlates to their pain. And in most cases, they're like, man, I feel better. I can't believe it. That was it. Well, it mm -hmm. wasn't it. It was, it was part of it. Right. Yeah. Right. So but again, I think this is kind of the hard part for us. Like we kind of understand this in the back of your, in, in, in your, in your mind, but like communicating that to a patient so that they can pull the nugget out that they need to move forward with. Right. So that's where communication comes in and being a good communicator and um, playing your cards. Right. So like, that's, yeah. that's kind of what it is. It's like, what card do I have to play with this patient to get them to buy into the process? And people Quiet. need something to work in. They they want something to work on. They're coming you with a coming to you with a problem that they want to solve. So we have to, on some level, define a problem for them. And I'm just very specific about saying that it's a opportunity, not the opportunity. And just like being that. careful with my words allows me to build in this complexity, but also set the expectations in the realm of reality, which is this is what we're going to start with. And mm -hmm. it's a process <laughs> and we have to kind yeah. of manage it from there. Well, you know, the impossible task here is 
you know, some people also want to shelf pain completely. Don't pay attention to it. We're pure functionalists, which is it's an impossible task because it's not going to happen. But also you right. have to pay attention to it because it's a significant representation of a physiologic response uh, or, you know, psychophysiologic response. But the interesting thing is if you're working with the elite athlete model, like I taught a class at Greg Rose a couple of weeks ago, he said, you know, he goes, I'm working above the pain line 90% of the time. He's not seeing people in pain. These people are coming to him for performance deficits or improve their performance. Right. What do you do if you don't have pain <laughs> as, you know, a subjective or, you know, uh, an input marker that you're running off of? You kind of have to start looking at, you know, movement screening, quality of movement, all these other things. And I think that also would lead us away from, well, if we, you know, use movement to modulate pain. And if we, if that's what we're going after, oh, I modulate or your pain's gone. Like you said, well, how do you, like, what's the heuristic? Is it the pro athlete ideally the idealized movement? Is it what biomechanics would state that is we're supposed to be going for? And I think what this really gets down to, if you just kept asking, you know, the five whys, you'd be like, oh, it's clinical expertise as much as people don't like to say that. Because how did you find out that that one guy's compensation is actually his superpower? Because you've done it for long enough. You learned right. from people that were better than you. You took the evidence at hand. Like you weren't uh, dogmatic. You didn't just, or you just lean on. You spend time in the trenches too. Yeah. You know, you got to be in it. No, and that was the best part about the fight that. Everybody right. wants to shit on that because they think that just like palpation isn't, you know, reliable from intra and iterator reliability. They're like, well, you know, clinical expertise, like your ability to assess, like, no, 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 we need complete objective ways to just put an iPad on somebody and say, this is what it is. I go, I, that's not what the best in the world are going to do. And I don't think that's going to change for a long time either, even with technological advances, stuff's going to change. Um, but in that realm, Let's say, do you have many like interns or, you know, new people that are working in your office? Like, do you have some sort of a, a way that you're teaching people this? Like, obviously, you know, you have your, your clinical expertise, all the places you came from. If somebody new is coming to your clinic, like, what are the, you know, one, two, three top things you're like, dude, you got to get this down from either a concept standpoint, a methodology standpoint, or just an overarching framework. Like, how do you approach that? <clears throat> Yeah, oh, it's such a good question. Yeah, so I do I do have interns all the time. Uh, <clears throat> I'm a clinical instructor for a local athletic training and physical therapy program. Mm -hmm. So we get students from college all the time. It's like one of my favorite things because it keeps me honest. It keeps me teaching, which I, I love to do. Um, but I kind of like, I, I kind of, again, it's like the big buckets, right? So, you know, I want to teach them movement evaluation just to go back to your point because i can think i think i can bridge it into here but mm -hmm. I, I love the idea and this is again kind of part of the pitch which is you know i've done these movement assessments with a client maybe who's in pain a lot of them are athletes or on some level rehabbing from an injury or maybe they're adult athletes who like crossfit or running or tries or whatever they're doing and it's like like well hey like so here are the things here are the where i think your biggest roi is on your time right now it's like, if we work on these particular attributes, I think this is going to help alleviate some of that maybe potential pain problem you have, but also improve your performance. And that's the cool thing that movement does for us is it allows us to, it allows us to kind of play both cards at the same time. Cause yeah. we have to have, we have to have something to start with. Right. It's like, and again, the traditional model has always been like, Oh, you're, you have lateral epicondylitis. Okay. Let's, let's load that those wrist extensors and like, just like strengthen the local tissue around that area. And I still think that has a time and a place for sure mm -hmm. as a part of the process, <clears throat> but it's like, like for you to say like, Oh, it hurts when you squat, just, you know, use less weight or squat a little differently. It's like, you're literally proving the point that somebody doesn't need your help. They can figure <laughs> that out on their own. It's like, to yeah. me, I just never understood a, how that got popular on social media to begin with. And B, it's like, you're literally making the case for why somebody doesn't need you. It's like, mm -hmm. you're just going to alter the movement pattern that currently bothers them. Okay, great. Anybody can figure that out on Google. But I think what people are looking for is somebody to work with that's going to help them troubleshoot along the way. Mm -hmm. So the way that I teach this to my interns in the beginning, I'm just like, I just want you to observe. I want you to watch. I want you to take notes. And then after we're done, I want you to ask me questions about what you saw. Cause that kind of allows me to figure out, okay, where, where are their current competencies at? 
And yeah. Where, where, and like, if they're like, Mike, I have no idea why you said X, Y, Z, one, two, three, it kind of gives me a better idea of where to start. So I have one of my therapists who's a massage therapist and he's a phenomenal massage therapist. But when I first met him, I had very little assessment and movement background. So that's where we spent a lot of time looking at movement assessment. And I sent him to different courses like SFMA and FRA mm -hmm. and, you know, giving him more opportunities to fill that bucket in his career. Right now, he's fantastic with it. Then I have another athletic trainer, really great with assessment and like injury assessment, particularly yeah. not as good with the hands on skills in the beginning. So it's like, okay, we're going to focus a little bit more on like bringing up your palpation and your manual skills acumen a little bit and, and the kind of filling in that gap. So I try to take the same approach with my interns and employees as I do with the patients, which is start them where they're at. Yeah and allow them to work in the compartmentalized field that they're good at while we bring up the other areas until they're comfortable with it. But mm -hmm. again, we do these in services in house where, you know, we do pain science lecture. And again, I want to expose them to it. And then I expose them to the dichotomy in the industry of like, Oh my God, pain science is everything. Pain science is all in your head, pains and output. But it's like, okay, where are the holes in that system? And my fate, I lead every in service with this line, which is, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Mm -hmm. Every single system out there is wrong, has holes in it. You can poke holes in any system out there, but I've always had success kind of layering these systems together. And again, some things are more applicable to certain athletes or people at different parts in the process. So we lean mm -hmm. on that system a little bit more, right? And then kind of bring them back to the middle where it's that, you know, rob that, strength and conditioning or performance training or semi-private, whatever you want to call it, their, their actual exercise regimen where we can kind of bring them back to that well-rounded program and have lots of movement variability and, and then also layer in the specificity maybe for their sport or for their injury. So I think it just depends on, you know, what somebody's prior experience is. And then I try mm -hmm. to help them fill in the gaps or just expose them. And what I look for in new employees and interns is just curiosity. I don't yeah. care if you don't have the skill set yet. If you're curious and you're willing to look at it a little bit more in your own time because you're genuinely interested, those are the people that I want here. Those For are sure. the people that I end up hiring because I know that curiosity, all I have to do is the fire's burning. All I have to do at that point is stoke it a little mm -hmm. bit here and there and turn people on to different stuff. And it's really fun. It's And, and it, it's fun for me because now I get to learn as they're learning and it's it's exciting and it's new and it's interesting, you know? Yeah. What, uh, so kind of not flipping the script, but for, you know, students or new docs or, you know, anybody in this, you know, entire profession that's kind of new, a lot of what's kind of interesting to me, which has always been part of the scenario of people are basing clinical models on economic outcomes, which has always been the case, right? Well, I, I can't do this fully functional approach because I have to see a certain amount of people to pay my bills and some people I get the scenario will not allow certain practice settings. I get it. Sure. In the face of that, I want people out there to kind of understand, you know, you, uh, how long have you been in private practice? I started doing this privately in like 2012. So 12 years. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously sustainable. Um, sure. doesn't sound like you're running a mill, <laughs> um, high level care that's individualized, uh, so I think there's just this, like, you can't give people the highest level care and still get paid well. Like in particular, in my profession, the chiropractic field, there is a big push of you have to shrink down visits as small as you can, even trying to provide this functional approach to maximize, you know, financial gain. And I, I get why, I mean, if you can sell more widgets, you're going to make more money, but mm -hmm. like, how do, how do you reconcile or help people reconcile in their minds, the balance between the highest level care and a sustainable economical economic model? Like, what are your, are there any principles that you stand by where you're like, yeah, we all get quality care. You know, it's going to, people are going to come back. I'm not talking the marketing aspects. I'm actually talking the inner workings of the model of like, how does it work where people can do this? Cause that is the biggest, in my opinion, People are like, oh, I love what you do. I could never do it though. Right. And you're like, what are you talking about? You know? So <clears throat> yeah, I think, listen, when you're, I think there's, there's value to being in that high volume model, especially early in your career. Like, and again, athletic training is unique in the sense that it's like sports medicine in a bubble. 
you know, when I was at the University of Florida, our operating budget for athletics was $90 million a year. That was the operating <laughs> budget for just athletics, right? Yeah. So the mindset is it doesn't matter if it gives your athlete a 1% benefit. We're going to do it because it doesn't matter. The, the money is yeah. – so and I, I was working with 50 athletes a day, you know? Again, I was working 100 hours a week in some cases yeah. and getting paid dog poop, but – but I got to see a lot of injuries and a lot of pain presentations and a lot of athletes that move at a high level and a lot of athletes that don't. And so every, every bit of the process in between. And I think that's the trenches time that's allowed me to do this at a high level now. So I think for somebody young, it's like spend some time working in a volume practice and learn what you hate about it. And, but in the process, just realize that, you know, we all know that growth comes from struggle. You know what I mean? So I think a lot of clinicians early in the career, like get in the trenches, treat your people, do the best you can. And it's not going to be perfect. And there's going to be aspects of it that you hate. Mm -hmm. um, but then, you know, what I'm proud of at the movement underground, is, like I said, the business model that matches the clinical model is like, we're, you know, we're, we're not the cheapest option, you know, for mm -hmm. sure. We have to charge a certain price point in order to be sustainable and be able to pay the staff what they're worth. And, have a business that makes money and that is, you know, uh, you know, scalable on some level. I think, mm -hmm. I think what we're doing now, I think the key in that is the education piece, the patient education yeah. piece. It's like, if I can spend a three month intensive with somebody, it's like boot camp. It's like movement boot camp. I'm going to give you a bachelor's degree in applied movement science in the next three months. That's applied specifically to you. And I focus on teaching these people big concepts understanding big concepts, understanding how all the different pieces of their life play a role in not only their pain, but their performance and everything in between. So as we're working with them on that three month, all, you know, they've invested in it, right? So they've mm -hmm. put up their money to have this experience. And then after that three months, having that monthly, you know, uh, continuity, which is like for us, basically a hybrid model, right? So for people that are local to us, Hey, join our gym work on our semi-private mm -hmm. model because that's very cost effective for the, for the client. And they still get a layer of individualization with that. And, you know, if they run into a road bump, boom, there's no barrier for entry to get back into the sports medicine model on mm -hmm. some level. But again, those are my easiest clients because they've already been through the system. They know the process, they know how we operate. So we can do a little bit better for them on that price after the fact on some of these continuity plans. Right. Um, and then obviously the online stuff where I think is like, you know, embracing the technology and embracing the fact that we have these amazing, you know, apps that you can white label for your business and, you know, film all your own videos and do a virtual. So like our big program, like our, our flagship offering, our three month program is a hybrid program. It comes with, the app access and the program design and the two-way messaging and the support, whether or not they're, whether they're training with us or not. So maybe they're only mm -hmm. coming once a week and they're doing all a lot of this work on their own. But again, that time spent in clinic is we're really working on educating them so that they feel confident in executing the plan on their own. And if they run into a trouble, they have those if then statements of like, okay, if you run into this problem, I want you to shoot me a text or you know, skip mm -hmm. it or you're going to regress it to this movement that we've gone over. And I think just building in those layers, again, it takes work and time up front. Uh, but I think that that's a cool part of it is like, okay, charge that premium price up front and then build in more accessibility on the after so they can keep that gravy train rolling, you know? Yeah, no, I love that. And I mean, that's what people are wanting now. Uh, you know, as well as I do, people want their handheld. They may seem like they don't, but they want a guide. I mean, that's what you're saying. Like they're coming to you for expertise. They want a guide more than ever. Like I just put a post up the other day about like declining health and increasing, you know, MSK disorders. Like people are more unhealthy. Like there are a plethora of issues with any one patient to tackle outside of the manual therapy movement piece. God, yeah. They are contributing to that, if not causative of it. Um, so I think. I think there's massive opportunities for this uh, individualized care at an extremely high level. And I honestly think that whether it's lack of confidence or, you know, maybe just a lack of know-how, which is why I like, you know, bringing it up in here is people are like, I just can't do that. And it's like, it's easier than you think. And people want it. It's, as you said, the key is education and not just education. I think we hear that in our profession, PT, Cairo, 
athletic training and we think educating them on like physiology and anatomy and biomech it's no no no, no. <laughs> it's educating them on like you said the big pieces of health where their pitfalls may be how you can help them but that how they can help themselves and that's right. they just need a guide and there there's not that many great guides out there so it's not that big of a lift to kind of stand out above the you know the cut and so that'd be my take on it I love it. And I, you know, and to your point, and I think people are st like, especially in our fields are starting to get more worried. Oh my God, AI is going to replace these jobs, blah, blah, blah. You can just AI, like what's wrong with me. And it's like, listen, as technology continues to make people more sedentary, the need for what we do is I think going to increase, not decrease. Mm -hmm. People are going to be, you know, everything's going to get automated more and people are going to be required to move and do less. And that is part of the crux in the Western world right now is that our lives are so easy that we're not required to do an awful lot of movement that we'll look at the chronic health conditions that we have, you know, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a big piece of the pain puzzle that, you know, again, beyond the movement, beyond the treatment stuff is there's so much value you can bring to somebody just helping them be aware that these things matter. They don't have mm -hmm. to have a degree in it to understand it. They just have to be aware that it's that it, that it matters, right? Yeah. Um, but I, again, I think it's we have to embrace that part of it and also recognize the opportun opportunities in front of us. And I think that now that we again, like, it's funny when I first started because as an athletic trainer, you know, insurance reimbursement is extremely difficult. There's mm -hmm. not there's not a lot of well when I started, there was virtually no model that I could find of athletic trainer and private practice. So I kind of started not knowing the legality of it. Like I, you know, obviously within staying within my lane, within my practice act and putting all the pieces in place, you know, physician referrals and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really have a model or, or a blueprint to follow. So I just kind of went for it to see what happened. And a, nobody really cared. And B, that was still towards the beginning of when cash pay practices across the board was still kind of a new thing. Like in the late mm -hmm. you know, 2012, 13, cash pay PT wasn't really a thing yet. I mean, maybe there was some at the highest yeah. levels, but there was it wasn't as widespread as it is now. And I think as insurance has continued to get watered down, people aren't stupid. They know. They yeah. know they're being neglected. I mean, they, they go to, they don't have to know that ice and stim is BS to feel neglected when they go to PT and they're not getting anything really. They're getting stuff that they could do at home on their own, a heat pack. Like, are you are, yeah. are we kidding? Are we joking? And so, and now the craziest thing is, is it's like, oh, oh, you guys must be awesome that you don't take insurance. That's because that's now people expect that people, <laughs> people are now, but now it's not so unfamiliar to pay out of pocket for something. Yeah. So um, so I think it's a really cool time to do it, but I do mm -hmm. think it's really valuable for young clinicians to just jump in with two feet, work for somebody else, work for an organization, work for a company and just see a lot of cases. I, I think, yeah. you, need, you know, you got to get reps and see what you like, see what you don't like, what's, and if you can develop a niche, awesome. If you like it all like me, it's like, that's cool too, but you still have to kind of find your way to communicate your message to people and differentiate differentiate yourself and again most of my clients unfortunately have all come through the insurance yeah. model already most of them 99 percent of them have like i'm like this is my last resort before i get my spine fused or before i have this done or i, I really don't want to get surgery but i think it's my only option it's like man that's crazy what's crazy is in you know the last harp on this, the insurance model now is basically just a cash-based model due to the the height of the deductibles. Yet people still think that like, I mean, we get calls all the time. I'd say we're 50-50, right? Like most right. of the, we're only a network with two carriers. So six, well, actually 60% of our people are cash. But so many people be like, oh, you're not a network. We're going to, well, and we'll ask the question now, do you know what your deductible is? No, you know, no, well, it's $8,000. You will never meet an eight thousand dollar deductible with us in an annual, you know, calendar year. Like it's not going to happen. And when they start to understand that, they're like, "Oh!" And like that's what people don't realize is you're paying a premium and you're still cash. <laughs> like, it's, right. I don't know. So you know that's just the insurance heart, which we both know. But whatever. Um, again, for students, docs in our profession that are listening to this, obviously you've done 
well on social media. I don't know how that's translated to practice growth or if it helps you guys in marketing or if it's just kind of a personal brand thing. Um, can you kind of weigh in on a few of those things of like how important has it been to your actual practice, right? And other practitioners within there. And then, uh, you know, how'd you do it? Like, what was the key? You know, was it just being authentic? Is it being who you are? Or was it like you hired somebody that was extremely tactical? Like, how'd you approach that? Uh, in the beginning, it was all, so, you know, when I first started my, my actual like brick and mortar business in 2014, you know, before that I was just do, I was working at a physical therapy clinic and I had my portable table and patients that were discharged. Like Mike, you know, you've helped me so much. Can we keep working together? And that's kind of how I figured out like, oh shit, like people will pay mm -hmm. me like a good amount of money <laughs> to come help them. I yeah. hadn't even realized it at that point because people were approaching me with it. It's like, are you willing to do that? I'm like, I don't, I don't know. And then slowly I was just going to like, uh, I couldn't, I could only see so many people before or after work. So I started raising the price and people would be like, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. No problem. I'm like, oh shit. Wow. People pay me 200 bucks for to come to their house and work with them for an hour. I'm like, fucking sign me up, man. I'm in. So when I started my brick and mortar, um, and, and again, I have an MBA, but I could promise mm -hmm. you that that MBA did not help me start a business. <laughs> Maybe I'm, with, I'm a business <laughs> undergrad. I'm with you. Yeah. I mean, it's, maybe it exposed me to things like I'm, I'm not, completely, yeah. you know, ROI, I know what that meant. Like I, I, I know yeah. what certain things are, but my program was like really heavy, like sponsorship and like more yeah. like the very traditional, like, you know, office building type of sports management, like business kind of stuff. Uh, but, you know, I read Gary V stuff and I'm like, okay, if I really want people to understand my approach and my message, I, I'm going to start, I got to start putting some kind of content out. And again, if you go back to my early content on YouTube and Instagram, it is absolutely atrocious. <laughs> it is so bad because at the time I was so worried that people would a look down on me because I was an athlete. I'm only an athletic trainer. I was mm -hmm. worried that, Oh my gosh, what if I have this piece of information wrong? Am I, am I just going to get absolutely demolished? And then, you know, I kind of got over it. I was like, I'm just going to put out stuff that I think is going to help people or just what I'm doing. And the response I got was overwhelmingly positive. Mm -hmm. you know, and it wasn't a lot in the beginning. I didn't have a lot of followers. And then, you know, I think for anybody starting, it, it's basically your resume now. So no matter how people find you, whether that's through paid advertising, paid marketing, they're going to go back and check your social media. And mm -hmm. whether you have followers or not is, is almost irrelevant. It's do you have content there that people can start to look at and – learn more about you and what you're doing and what your approach is. And then they'll decide if that's in line with what they're looking for. So yeah. I think even like, don't worry about the followers, the likes, the comments, just have something there that people like, you know, like if you're on Netflix and you watch a, a trailer for a show and you're like, man, that show's awesome. And then you watch the first episode, you're like, Oh, this is really cool. What do you do? You binge it. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's like people stumble across you, whether it's on social media, maybe your website, maybe they got a referral from a friend and they come across, give them something to binge, give mm -hmm. them something to read, give them something to watch, give them something to look at so that they can start to warm themselves up to the idea of maybe they want to take that next step. So I think that's where it's the, really the most valuable. Um, so in the beginning, I did all my own video editing, all my own content creation. I had no mm -hmm. real plan. It was just post and pray for the most part. I had a few posts that did really, really well. And that started building the following a little bit. As my following kind of grew, I got a little bit more confident. Mm -hmm. um, and then the more content I put out, the more, you know, people started asking me what I thought about certain things. I'm like, man, people actually care what I think. That's crazy to me. I don't, you know, cause I, even to this day, I do not think I'm the best, you know, like I'm, I'm still learning. I still, I know that there's mm -hmm. immense, amounts of information out there that I still don't know. Um, but it's really, it's validating for sure that people want to follow your page and they, they, they look at, they look up to you on some level. I think that's really cool. Um, but it, but my business was doing good, was doing well bef long before I had a, a huge mm -hmm. fund. So, you know, we were, we were starting to really prove this cash model and that, and then again, at the end of the day, services worth talking about are going to get talked about. Yeah. So on, on one level, if you're not gaining traction on social media, you, you really have to ask yourself, like, are, are you that good? And, and I'm not trying to be mean, but there's a, yeah. there's people out there that just are not that good at what they do. Yeah. And, and they want to get traction on social media, but their content is like, it's just not that good. 
you know, yeah. and, and again, I'm not trying to blow smoke up my own ass or, or any of that stuff. It's just, and just to clarify, you're, you're saying not good at, not that they're not good at making content. You're questioning, are they not good at the actual work right, skill? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. And then oh, that yeah. represents itself or manifests itself in the, yeah, the content. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you got to have, I think the base of competence has to be there. Like where you're yes. doing this at a better level than the standard operating procedure. Like yeah. you can get better results than the standard PT or the standard Cairo, the standard massage therapist. And what I mean by standard is like the mill, like yeah. you're outperforming the mill. You have to, on some level do that. Right. Cause it's like, it's like investing, right? It's like, you can't outperform an index fund. You're not that good of an investor. You yeah. just invest in the index fund. Right. So you have to, you have, the skills have to be there on some level. And then you have to be able to, you have to be able to, display the skill in a way that's consumable, mm -hmm. you know? And so for me, again, one of the lessons I learned was like a lot of my earlier content, so technical, so deep because that's what I was into. Mm -hmm. And some people gravitated towards that, which was awesome. Like, again, I had never intended to be the train, the trainer guy. Like, you know, I, that was never the initial intention. I was just like, I have a camera. I have this athlete who's willing to let me film the session. I'm just going to film the session and, put the whole clip on YouTube unedited. <laughs> that was it. And people, yeah, and then people it. in the comments yeah. are like, dude, this guy's freaking awesome. Like, wow, I never thought of it that way. And it was just like, you're a fly on the wall in my treatment room. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. And it, me doing my patient education was you being educated at the same time. That's what it was. Now yeah. it's more polished. Now I have a videographer and mm -hmm. it's actually amazing because my, but our approach is exactly the same. It's like he comes mm -hmm. in, he's a fly on the wall. I'm just doing my thing. But the cool part now and where I've seen a lot of growth recently has been he picks the stuff he thinks is cool and compelling mm -hmm. instead of me picking it. Because what I think is cool and what he thinks is cool is completely different. However, the stuff that he's chosen, like there was a post that I got 5 million views on on Instagram. And it was me talking about like the deep front line mm -hmm. uh, about how like, you know, a lot of times plantar fasciitis is really like post post tib tendinopathy that gets mm -hmm. misdiagnosed in the early on and then gets completely mismanaged from then on. Yeah. And it got like 5 million views and all of a sudden my Instagram just blew up. And I thought it was, he sent me like six clips and it was the last one I posted because I didn't think it was that good. I didn't think, I, I thought it lacked context. I'm like, people are not going to have any fucking clue what this 30 second clip is about. Yeah, like they're not. And then it was the one that went viral. And then all of a sudden, like two weeks later, you know, Mark Bell is DMing me on Instagram saying like, hey, man, is there any chance we can get you to fly out and <laughs> come on my podcast? And I'm like, you got to be kidding me, man. You got to be like, what? Yeah, which is a good what? point, right? The, and the reason I want to ask that is I think there's an overemphasis on new grads, young docs, new clinicians on having polished content because they think the polished content is the sales point. You can't, nope. you can only put lipstick on a pig so much and it's still a pig. Like you, like you said, <laughs> exactly. Build the competence. And no, I'm not saying don't do polished content because you can build a, but like the last thing I would want to happen and I'm not in this realm. When I started doing social media, it was, you know, I did no, <laughs> I, there's still all the videos out there. I didn't talk. I was just doing exercise videos for our clients. So I had videos to send them. So it's just no talking me doing like Cobras and stuff. And people are like, right. now they comment on my videos like, why don't you explain this? I'm like, that, it was never like, it's just funny. But what I would have not wanted when I was in my first year of practice is somebody thinks I'm amazing because of social media. They show up to my office, have a bad experience, write some review and you're like, oh shit, like I'm not performing up to the level of my content. But I think that's like the, the overarching like goal now is like, oh, I'm just going to get bandwidth online and then that will feed the business. It's like, what does your business stand on? Like, that's right. the key. Like, again, word of mouth, you could, you could never be on social media in 2024 and still build a rock star business. Absolutely. But people don't, people don't think like that. They're like, no, yeah. I have to do this. I think it, listen, I do think it is, I think you do have to do it on some level. You got to play the game. You got to be, you have to have skin in the game on some level. But for the reason that I said, just something for people to go see what you're about. Yeah. So I, I do believe I like the, the resume, yeah. the authenticity parts. You, well, again, it's, Listen, man, it's the currency that today's people trade with mm -hmm. the attention economy. That's what it is. You know, like, you know, look at the Kardashians. You have five talentless women that have a billion dollar empire. Whoa. whoa, whoa. They're, ta they're, they're talentless. 
you could put that on your, it's a, I'll take that to the <laughs> bank, but there's a lesson to be learned there. Yeah. They've, they've captured people's attention and they've been able to monetize that. And so. Yeah. Applaud and tip the cap. And like, how do you learn from that? Well, provide yep. some value, provide yeah. some value. Well, and again, even my young coaches and they all have imposter syndrome. And I'm like, listen, we've built this platform. The movement underground has, a, has some brand equity now on some level. Mm -hmm. I want you to use that brand equity to level up your, your personal brand. I want you to do that. And because at the end of the day, you still know a lot more than the people that you're teaching. Yeah. You don't have to know as much as me or as much as you in order to put out good content. Does it help somebody? Right. And if that's your authentic, authentic intention, it's like, I'm just going to put this out there with the hopes that it helps one person, then awesome. You're going to do really well. And then you just have to be consistent. You know, yeah. and again, I'm the, I'm an overnight success that took 10 years though. You know what I mean? Like, it's not like this I'm, just happens. Like I yeah. started with a portable, a portable table, table. jumping turnstiles in New York city. Cause I didn't have any money. I was literally, I was literally stealing from the MTA. Don't arrest me now. New York city, please God. I would throw my table over the turnstile and hop the turnstile because I was absolutely broke. It was absolutely broke. By the time I paid my rent and my student loans, I was broke. I was done for the month. So, and then, <laughs> and then I rent, then I re didn't even rent space. I had a table in a gym, in the gym open. And then I would see, and I'd give the, the, you know, the gym owner, like whatever his cut was. Right. Mm -hmm. Then I rented some space and then I rented some bigger space, still subleasing. And it wasn't until last year that I opened my own full brick and mortar facility. So, so I, but I was building content the whole way. I was building systems yeah. the whole way. I was finding out ways that I could deliver more value to my clients the whole time. And again, most of my clients come from word of mouth, even still, even yeah. still. No, I, I mean, you hit on so many good points there of slow growth and not, there's no right or wrong way to do it. You know, nope. we took out an SBA loan because both of us were doing the same thing and there was no other income coming in that house. I mean, we funded it, you know, bootstrapped it. That's not the right way, but like there is no, there's not one way to work with a patient. Nope. There's no one way to do a business, but the, the principles still apply across the board. Competency leads the way you have to have some forward facing value, right? Whether that's social media, word of mouth, whatever it is, community involvement. Sure. Um, yeah. So I can, I mean, we, I know you and I are basically in the same space, but just, it's good for people to hear it again. Um, I like to kind of wrap these up with two, I ask everybody the same question. So if you've ever listened to one of these, you heard them, but, uh, the first question is, what is something that you, for a long time, and let's, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the clinical realm, but um, you thought was true and maybe in the, you know, not too recent past, like son of a bitch, I was wrong. Or I've completely rethought, you know, that process. And I mean, there's so many things in our field that you could bring up, but is there anything that really stands out to you? Hmm. And I think I'm going to start interjecting like Jeopardy music because everybody thinks, which I love that they think. That means it's yeah. a decent question. So, yeah. I mean, listen, I, I have changed my stance on a lot of things over the years for sure. You know, manual therapy, like we talked about, was one of them. I used to be heavy mechanical. Yep. And like, again, like I – and it's funny because even when I got onboarded with Rock Tape and with Capo and, you know, at that time was like around the transition time that I started kind of like really adopting more of this neurophysiological model and kind of – because again, even my earlier content before that, one of the reasons Rock Tape almost didn't want to work with me was because a lot of my manual therapy content before that was very mechanically based. Hmm. But it was just because yeah. I was like, oh, here's how to release a quad. I was trying to take what I was doing and make it uh, digestible for social media. So, But yeah. again, that's what the perception of like my approach was until they started really – until Allison watched my YouTube, Right. And so the Long longer format, form content yeah. and yeah. so the whole session was like, oh, wow, this guy is really more in line with what we're doing than maybe we thought initially. Because when I mm -hmm. reached out to Rock Tape, like, hey, I really want to teach you. I love your stuff. They're like, no. And then like a week or two later, they're like, hey, can you come to Colorado? I'm like, I'm like, yeah. I'm like, I'll, I'll start walking now. Like when? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, um, so again, it's, it's funny how that happened. So yeah, I've changed my mind a lot on stuff. I changed my mind on stretching. I used to be, I used to have all my athletes stretching a ton. I don't, I very rarely do that now. Um, mm -hmm. I used to be, you know, 
very bullish on having pricing models for that fit every single person. And now I'm not anymore. I it's here's my option. This is what you, this is what I have to offer you. Let's see if we can make this work for you. You yeah. know what I mean? So like even just like trying to solve every problem for people before they told me it was a problem. Right. Yeah. And I think that's something I've changed. <laughs> right. Which I, I started creating problems that weren't even there. Yeah. Right. So I think getting out of my own way definitely started to help. Um, but yeah, like that, you know, definitely a lot of clinical stuff, definitely a yeah. lot of training stuff. Like, again, I, I was part of all of, again, it's weird now being like plus 20 years into this. Mm -hmm. you know, I, I never used to be the older guy in the room. Now that's now who I am, which is kind of bizarre for me. Yeah. But it's, um, you know, I, we, you know, we were part of all of the waves, all the modalities. Oh gosh, the functional training wave, get away from isolated work. Now it's all about isolated work. And you know what I mean? It's just so funny how things come in and out of favor and they always cycle. And I'm just like, awesome. It's so funny to watch people argue about this shit on social media. And I'm just like, wait five more years. <laughs> well, that's that, falls out of you know, that's a superpower of just of clinical experience isn't necessarily just the the knowledge that you gain. It's just the observational power over time. Like you've right. seen trends come and go, whereas people are like, they don't see it as a trend. They see it as gospel. Right. And then that gets like that gets not I wouldn't say dangerous. I would just say it's polarizing. People get contentious and then energy gets wasted. Like you're right. not winning over the hearts and minds of anybody by winning your online argument and like the faster you realize that, the better off you're going to be, in my opinion. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, flipping that question around, what is something, uh, again, can be any realm that you're just like, dude, I know this is true. I know this is the way it is. And maybe there's not evidence, peer reviewed articles to substantiate that. You're just like, I, yep, this is the way it is. And I'm going with that, you know, for better or worse. Is there anything that sticks out in that realm? Oh, man, I, you know, I, I just, humans are just infinitely com complex. You know what I mean? No nothing. When people tell me stuff that's super fringe, maybe now I'm like, yeah, I, mm -hmm. I can, I can see it. You know, there's something mystical about human beings and humanity that you can't explain. And, and that's why I really do think like the relationship in many cases is more powerful than the techniques. It's more yeah. powerful than the exercise prescription. It's, it's, having somebody believe in your ability to help them get there. But how do you do that? You, it, it, you know, and I don't know how to teach that part. I don't yeah. know how to teach people called the soft skills or EQ or, you know, you know, is it, is it just intelligence in general that helps you do that? I don't really know what it is, but like I look at my staff and every single one of them just has something. It They have that it thing. And I, mm. I don't know what it is. I can't put a finger on it. But when they intern for me, I'm like, I need this person to be a part of what I'm doing. So yeah. a perfect example, my massage therapist. He sought me out years ago when he was in massage school. This is a college baseball player, tore up his elbow, you know, and then realized that he wanted to help other athletes and other people overcome this, but also realized that I, there's just no way I can go back to school and, and afford that. So he did a massage therapy program and he, and he, he approached me about interning with me and this guy, Anthony Pranzo, he's, he's one of my, all my staff just showed up every day and just was curious and just, you know, he has a, a way of looking at problems and a way of communicating to people and people get on his table and it's just like, you could see the stress melt off their body before he even does anything. He's just got that, the personality, the presence I don't mm -hmm. know what it is, but in any case, there, I hired him on COVID happens. We're shut down I and mean, we're in New York, right? So when I mean shut down, we were shut <laughs> down. Yeah. Right? And I'm slowly watching this thing that I've been building for years falling apart. And like, man, I don't know if, if I'm going to be able to, and my intention was to pay the guy and keep him on payroll and, and try to figure it out. But you know, eventually yeah. we just couldn't do it. And so, you know, he started doing some other stuff and I kind of lost him for a few years there. And then when I was building this facility, I was like, hey, man, I was like, and I tried to bring him back a few times. We just couldn't make the numbers work. And he came to the new facility and I'm like, I, what, what is it going to take for me to get you back? Because, but, and he's just like, man, I, 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 you could find somebody better than me. I'm like, no, I can't. Because it has nothing to do with the skills. It has nothing to do with your knowledge. I want you here. Because mm -hmm. whatever you have is the special sauce that I'm looking for to build with. I'm super bullish on that. 
there's something uh, there's certain people who do this very very well for not for not the x's and o's reasons yeah i yeah and i agree with you and the tough thing is for you and i being business owners that's what you'd want to hire on but like you said you can't nail it down and it working interviews for us so like interns with us like nobody would ever work for us if you don't intern for us like i'm not gonna yeah. hire somebody you'd have to be here for a I'm same extended on period of time because one lesson i've learned to kind of add in on that is just like you know pressure creates diamonds it also exposes like you ain't ever gonna make it and you'll see people that look like right and have all the x's and o's not necessarily break and fold, but like, you can just tell like, this isn't their jam. Like they're not here for the highest level patient care. They're not here for the patient or there's something that you're just like, yeah, you're not gonna, you know, that fire, it doesn't matter how much I soak it. It's not going to go to the level we would need it for this practice. And it's not that they're a bad clinician. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it's not a good fit for some reason. And then that, that reason that they don't fit is also hard to, you know, not abstract. You're like, I can't. Right. It's just not a good fit. It's hard to quantify. Thing. I yeah. think to add to that, I think the the th the thread that I have noticed between all the guys on my staff is they all come from that adversity. They yeah. all have overcome something really difficult in their own life. And that's true for me too. So I lost my parents very young. You know, mm -hmm. I struggled with pain and depression and anxiety and all of those kinds of things. And I was in a really dark place for a really, really long time. So like, you know, the, the funny part, people are like, Hey Mike, what do I have to do to learn and know what you know? And I'm like, well, are you willing to spend 10 years in a dark room with a single bare light bulb and the water dripping through the ceiling and just like being in the darkest fucking place you could be. And the only thing that gave me comfort was like my career, my work, my, yeah. the thing that I was putting my, that would, for whatever reason, that sports medicine and rehab, it just grabbed my attention. It's just never let go. And that's mm -hmm. all my guys, all my yeah. guys, they all had injuries. Not... They've all struggled in their personal lives on some level. They've all found this thing of helping other people. And in doing so that's helped them. And I think for yeah. that's the one through line that I've, that I've noticed, not that I'm looking for people with trauma, but it just happens to be a common denominator that I think unites us on, on some level. And, and it's giving that, like they have a why they're doing this. There's, yeah. there's, yeah. I firmly believe wherever you, you know, faith you're familiar with, but I firmly believe that problems are put in your path for a reason. And most people find whatever you want to call it. I don't even care. I don't think people have a singular purpose in life. I think you find purpose or drive meaning from things for various reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but I think problems that are set in your path are where people are the most successful. If you kind of lean into that and overcome it. And I mean, that's what you're basically saying. So yeah, I couldn't agree more. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And most of the people that are in our office, similar scenario, if not identical scenarios. And I just, our field in particular garners that. I don't think there's a lot of bankers out there that went through financial downturn as an eight-year-old and we're like, oh, I want to be the president <laughs> of a bank, but right, right. maybe they had a, a family that was poor. I, you know, there's all these reasons that are motivating you, but just like working with a patient, if we can create that intrinsic motivation, that's what we're talking about is tapping into is like, well, why are you doing this thing in the first place? Cause it is a grind and it's not always the most fun career in the world and you're going to get your teeth kicked in. And, um, yeah, so you gotta, you gotta have that purpose behind it. But, um, man, I'm, Hey, I'm really glad that we finally made this work. Yeah, me too, man. Weeks, uh, back and forth. I'm glad that I finally got to talk with you uh, somewhat in person after, uh, you know, Capo connecting us and knowing who you uh, were for a while, but not talking to you. Uh, where can people find out more about you? Um, obviously, you're online. So what's your what's your socials where people can get in contact with you? So I, like I said, I'm pretty easy to find now, which is kind of cool. But at Mike Stella underscore ATC is my my uh, Instagram and uh, X X handle. Um, so more mostly active, mostly on Instagram and YouTube. The YouTube is the Movement Underground, which is also the name of the business. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the like our brick and mortar facility is the Movement Underground. We're on Long Island in Seaford, New York. So about an hour east of New York City. Um, so you can check us out there as well. And yeah, that's that's basically it. All right, man. Well, any uh, last thoughts, comments, uh, sage words of advice before we hop off here? Um, 
No, I think, I think we covered it. I really, this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate you accommodating me for a second time and I'm um, glad we made this happen too. And you have a beautiful facility and, and it was unfortunate that we didn't get to we meet moved. in person. We moved since you've been here. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, yeah, I mean, so your old facility was awesome. And truthfully, a lot of like, when I went in there, I was like, oh man, I like this. I like that. So I've probably stolen bits of what you've done and, and put it in here some, somehow. But again, that, that was always my favorite part about rock tape too that was so valuable to me beyond just a job it was just like seeing how other p people did yeah. it. Cause there is, like you yeah, said, you there is no right way. You get to research other people's practices for years. Huh. Going I, yeah. A hundred percent. And so, yeah, and that was like such a cool thing that I'm very blessed and grateful for having him had that opportunity. But again, it's, it, it, it just proved to me that there is no one way to do it. And yeah. And don't be afraid to do it your way. I think would be the sage piece of advice because you are going to appeal to the person who's looking for that different thing, who's looking for your approach or your aesthetic or your, uh, you know, the feeling they get when they come into your space. So there's just so much room for creativity in what we do, even anchoring to sound scientific principles. And I think mm -hmm. that's the magic is can you get the science and the art to meld together in your way and deliver that authentically and, and, and um, altruistically, you know, and mm -hmm. I think if you could do those things, you're going to, it's like literally the guaranteed recipe for success. You, then you just got to stick with it. Keep pushing yeah. it forward. Awesome, man. Well, thanks again for doing this. And uh, I'll be putting links to all of Mike's info. So if you're interested in getting a hold of him or learn more about him, uh, you can do that. And uh, thanks again, man. We'll be talking. Thank you, Dr. Bo. Have a great one. Take care. Yeah. Thank you for tuning in. Please subscribe via YouTube, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. If you like the message, please share it. We appreciate it. Thank you.